Today's reading is one of my favorite papers that we read in this class, and I want to provide some background that will help make sense of this paper and make it easier to understand what the author, David Parnas, is talking about, why this is so important, and why the things that he talks about here continue to be relevant even almost 40 years after the work that he did. David Parnas was a respected software engineer who was asked to be on a committee reviewing the work of the strategic defense system. And I've taken my requirements from the very highest and most reliable source, uh, Ronald Reagan. Who's... The strategic defense system was part of a Reagan administration project to intercept and destroy ballistic missiles. I call upon the scientific community in our country, those who gave us nuclear weapons, to turn their great talents now to the cause of mankind and world peace, to give us the means of rendering these nuclear weapons impotent and obsolete. This was during the Cold War, when Americans were worried about Soviets attacking them with nuclear armed missiles, and we wanted to be able to shoot them down. This was a major and controversial plan by Ronald Reagan and his Defense Department to come up with a complicated system, sometimes called Star Wars after the movie, to be able to shoot down incoming ballistic missiles. As Parnas describes in this article, that was a hard problem. It didn't really work out, and many of the reasons why it didn't work out relate to how to write computer programs, precisely the topic of this course. So that's why we're looking at this paper and why what Parnas has to say continues to be relevant many years later. Parnas was part of this panel in which he reviewed much of the work that was done as part of the Strategic Defense Initiative. And then he quit. And he quit because he thought it couldn't work. This paper lays out why he thought it couldn't work and what that says about how we build software. Parnas describes several reasons, each given in a section of this document, why he doesn't think this is going to work. First one is about why software is hard to build. The second one is about why the Strategic Defense Initiative software won't work. Why military software that existed at the time in the 1980s was insufficient why research in how to engineer better software, which is what Parnas did in his research, would not be able to solve this problem, why he doesn't think artificial intelligence will solve this problem, why he doesn't think automatic programming, which might be described as higher level programming languages or program generation, won't help, why program verification won't help, and why it's not a good idea to keep funding this project, even if it won't work, just because it funds research in software. I think it's pretty clear that that's not a great approach, but some people were arguing that. One important aspect of the background here is that in 1985, when this was written, most people weren't working with software controlled systems. Cars weren't using computers. People didn't have computers in most of their jobs. Phones weren't computerized. Buses weren't computerized. Most people worked in general with analog systems, whether those were clocks or machines or engines or doors. None of those things were connected to the internet. The internet as it was, was still a government only project that reached very few people. So Parnas is trying to explain to a broad audience why computer programs are hard to work with and why that impacts the desire to build a weapon system like the anti-ballistic missile system that they were trying to build in the Strategic Defense Initiative. There's lots of really interesting things in this paper, but I want to talk in particular about the first essay, Why Software is Unreliable. If you think about how most objects in your life behave, they behave in what's called a continuous manner. That is, small changes in what you do to them produce small changes in their behavior. 
Think about a piece of furniture. If you push it a little, it might move a little. If you push it a lot, it will move more. But it's not the case that if you go from pushing it a tiny bit to pushing it a tiny bit more, a chair will suddenly fly across the room. But that's exactly how software works. You go from one behavior to a totally different behavior with a tiny change in input. You'll have seen that already in the programs you write in this class. You can make a tiny bug, and Dr. Rackett says the whole thing doesn't work. You can make a tiny change, and you go from one result to a totally different result that bears no resemblance to the output you got before. Because of this, our usual approaches for understanding the behavior of things in the world don't work for software. You're assuming continuous functions, that a small change isn't going to cause a big change in behavior. And in software, there is no such thing as almost right. You don't have to demand perfection, but you can't assume that just because you're only one bit off from the right software, whatever that is, that you're better off than if you were 100,000 bits off. Lots of people have come up with lots of other ideas, but this fundamental challenge is still really unresolved and still makes it harder to think about how software is going to work than anything else. Furthermore, software is extremely complicated. If you think about a machine, even a complicated machine like a clock with many gears, how many possible positions can it be in? Well, something like 12 times 60, perhaps. One for each hour, and then one for each minute. And if you have a second hand, you have 60 again. Now think about a computer program. If you define three constants in your program, one which is a number from 1 to 12, and two are numbers from 1 to 60, you already have as many possibilities as that extremely complicated clock. Create a few more variables, which is easy to do in a program just a few lines long, and pretty soon we have hundreds of times more complexity than a clock. And of course, we're often not restricting ourselves to numbers from 0 to 12. We're going to have numbers that can be as big as you want. In Dr. Racket, numbers can be billions, trillions, or much, much bigger. Very quickly, we have more possibilities than we could ever consider individually. So again, we have way more possibilities in simple software programs than in extremely complex machines. The combination of these two problems means that it's really hard to think about and ensure that software works correctly. And that's a big reason why all the software that you work with runs into bugs all the time on your phone, on your computer, when you work with a web page, when you work with software that IU has you use, or when you hear that some large business has their software crash. And Parnas' introduction to this is a really good description of what's going on there. The remainder of the essay talks about lots of things that people might have thought would fix the problem and why he thinks they won't, ranging from artificial intelligence. I have a little saying that a lot of people I know that are interested in artificial intelligence are interested for the same reason that some people are interested in artificial limbs. They're missing one. But <laughs> to proving that your software is correct using mathematics. The best mathematical tools, all the ones that I learned in engineering school, really only work well for systems that can be described by continuous functions. Software can't. To automatically generating programs that work correctly. If you don't know what the specifications are, automatic programming isn't going to help a bit. To coming up with new engineering approaches. See, it's very hard for me to talk against this stuff because a lot of this work is mine. And <laughs> Parnas shows why he believes that none of these are going to satisfactorily resolve the problems that he saw in the Strategic Defense Initiative, and thus why he didn't think it would succeed. As it turned out, it mostly didn't succeed. The prototypes that were built were not able to effectively shoot down incoming ballistic missiles, and there's still no effective solution to this problem. 
It didn't work. No way to make that good news. No. These are facts. We deal with facts. The problems of software reliability also continue to plague us, and the reasons that Parnas lays out are key to that. We've made big advances in everything from software engineering to artificial intelligence to program verification, all things that he talks about. But the problems that he lays out continue to be major issues, and none of these have made software perfect and reliable. I don't want perfection. I just want a level of confidence comparable to that that you feel when you go out in the morning to start your car. Finally, one reason that I really like this essay is that it emphasizes the importance of thinking about what software is actually going to do. Parnas is working on building a real system. Whether we think that system is a good idea, whether we want to work for building military applications, the relationship between the software we build and its application in the real world is important both in terms of thinking about what we want to build, and what impact we want to have on the world, but also thinking about how that desired impact influences the software we're trying to build. One thing I really like about this paper is that we can draw connections between it and many of the other things we talked about, whether it's the possibilities of enormous numbers of states that we saw in Aronson's essay, or the relationship between AI and correctness that we heard Timnit Gebru talk about. We'll read more things in this class, and all of them will also find interesting connections to this paper. I hope you enjoy it as much as I do.